everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Michael Larson, who will be speaking with, to us today about bariatric endo endoscopy. Um, Dr. Larson is our newest addition to our incredible UCSF interventional endoscopy team, however, is certainly not new to the field of interventional endoscopy with over 13 years of experience. He is originally from Canada and went to Columbia University for his undergraduate degree in biology, followed by medical school at Columbia. He then moved to California for the first time to complete his residency at Stanford before joining us at UCSF for GI fellowship. After general GI training, he traveled to to wonderful Boston to complete his advanced endoscopy year at Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and then started working in the field at Virginia Mason Medical Center. In 2023, he and his family moved back to beautiful uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area to join us as UCSF faculty, where we have been very excited to have him, um, where he currently serves as Director of Therapeutic and Bariatric Endoscopy. He's also a research mentor to fellows and provides excellent clinical pearls. Um, outside of work, he enjoys watching baseball, running, traveling, and spending time with his family. We are so excited to hear your talk today. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all doing extremely well. Uh, Zoe, thank you so much for the introduction. It has been uh, so great being back at UCSF this year. It's been uh, really great getting to work with all of you guys, all the fellows. Um, really enjoyed it. Today I'm going to be talking with all of you about one of my favorite topics. I will cover things that are important for general gastroenterologists and we'll go through some of the more therapeutic interventions uh, that we, we perform for these patients. Uh, so hopefully there's something for everyone. This is kind of, a, there's a lot to cover so I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so at the beginning, I'll just give you a little overview about obesity and particularly about uh, bariatric surgery. I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of the uh, different post-surgical anatomies that you're going to encounter. Uh, and then we'll get into the meat of the topic, which is the endoscopic uh, diagnosis and management of uh, bariatric surgery complications. As I think you all know, uh, obesity is a big problem in the United States. However, it has also uh, turned into a worldwide pandemic with increasing rates in developing countries. It is now far more common uh, worldwide than hunger. Unfortunately, obesity is associated with multiple comorbidities and increases the patient's risk of death, primary, primarily from increased rates of malignancy and cardiovascular disease. You can see on the, the maps down at the bottom of this slide uh, that obesity is a worldwide problem. In the United States, rates have gradually increased to the point where now most of the country has uh, obesity rates greater than 35 or 40 percent. California is still one of the few states in the yellow, but even that is an obesity rate greater than 25 percent. So this is a, a really big problem. So this slide shows you uh, the currently available treatment options for obesity. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on the ones in the top right-hand corner, which are the bariatric surgeries. Uh, these surgeries are very effective at uh, inducing weight loss, uh, but unfortunately they are the uh, sort of highest risk interventions available. Uh, and that's where the complications that we're gonna be talking about today come in. In the United States, uh, patients can qualify for bariatric surgery if they have a BMI greater than 40 or a BMI greater than 35 with associated comorbid conditions such as type 2 diabetes. Uh, but you'll see patients who go to other countries uh, where they can get bariatric surgery for much lower BMIs. Um, so patients will travel down to Mexico or even further away and, and have BMIs of 30 or, or even lower sometimes. There's actually interesting data coming out of India um, showing that ruin y gastric bypass is actually a really good treatment for patients with type 2 diabetes who even have normal BMIs uh, because of the hormonal effects of uh, bypassing the duodenum. <clears throat> this slide shows you the various uh, post-bariatric surgery anatomies that you'll encounter. Uh, today, we'll be mostly focusing on the sleeve gastrectomy the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, and a little bit about the lap band. Um, but you will uh, occasionally see patients with the one on the right, the biliopancreatic diversion. Uh, 
Uh, this is actually a very effective surgery, uh, but unfortunately it has a lot of complications. Uh, so it's typically reserved for uh, super obese patients and uh, not really commonly performed. It involves the creation of a sleeve gastrectomy uh, with the addition of a very distal bypass. Uh, so there's only about a 50 centimeter common channel in the ilium. The majority of the small bowel is bypassed by food completely or does not get exposed to bile or pancreatic enzymes. And so there's a lot of malabsorption with this operation. In the bottom left-hand corner, the vertical banded gastroplasty is no longer uh, a surgery that anybody's performing, uh, but you will occasionally still see these patients. Uh, this was last done in the 90s. Uh, patients will, who've had this will probably tell you that they had a gastric bypass, even, even though they didn't. The other name for that surgery is the gastric stapling. Uh, these patients do have a small gastric pouch similar to a gastric bypass. But once you leave the pouch uh, and go through that outlet, you're still in the stomach rather than ending up in the small bowel as you do with the gastric bypass. This surgery uh, was limited by frequent breakdowns in the gastric staple line, uh, which resulted in significant weight regain. Uh, so it was replaced uh, by these other surgeries. The gastric bypass is really still the gold standard of bariatric surgery. Uh, it involves the creation of a very small gastric pouch from the proximal uh, roughly four centimeters of the stomach. Uh, the remainder of the stomach is uh, then excluded. It's not removed, it's still in the patient, uh, but it's no longer exposed to food. And it's then referred to as the gastric remnant or the defunctionalized stomach. Um, the surgeon then also transects the small bowel, uh, about 40 centimeters distal to the ligament of trites, and then uh, takes the distal small bowel and attaches it to the gastric pouch with a gastrojejunostomy. Uh, the two limbs of small bowel are then anastomosed uh, side to side in a jejunojejunostomy. The limb of bowel that goes from the pouch to the jejunojejunostomy is called the rule limb. The rule limb, um, will be of varying lengths. It's mostly surgeon dependent. Um, the modern gastric bypass, though, typically the rule is not too long. Uh, you can often reach the jejunojejunostomy just with a standard EGD scope, uh, but you will definitely see some with very long uh, rule limbs, uh, particularly patients who had their surgeries many years ago. Turned out that having a really long rule limb didn't really produce more weight loss, which is what was originally thought and just made it more challenging to manage complications. Uh, the weight loss with rheumatoid gastric bypass is excellent. Typically, patients will lose about 30% of their total body weight. Uh, most of that weight loss happens in the first year uh, or two years after the surgery. Uh, the next or last surgery is the sleeve gastrectomy. Um, so this is now the most popular surgery in the United States. Uh, it involves the removal of the greater curve of the stomach, which results in this very long staple line and a, and a very small tubular shaped stomach, which is referred to as the gastric sleeve. Uh, the part of that greater curve of the stomach is not left in place like in a gastric bypass, it is completely removed. So this is not a reversible surgery. The uh, small tubular stomach essentially makes it so the patient feels very full after they eat. And so they get a it's called a restrictive effect. They don't feel like they can eat as much as they used to. Uh, there's additionally weight loss uh, because of a decrease in the amount of ghrelin uh, because the greater curve of the stomach has most of the cells that produce ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone that makes you feel hungry. Uh, so it's believed that some of the weight loss is from that decrease in ghrelin. The weight loss, again, is excellent with this surgery. It's not quite as good as the gastric bypass, uh, but patients will lose 25 to 30 percent of their total body weight. Okay, so now that we're all on the same page in terms of the post-surgical anatomies, we're going to start talking about the diagnosis and management of the complications of these surgeries. So this is a long list of complications. Unfortunately, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are the ones that you will uh, see as a gastroenterologist. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to cover all of them today. We will cover the ones that are underlined. Uh, in terms of the other ones, uh, 
Uh, I think with re regard to GERD, I think you should know um, that Grunewai gastric bypass is actually an excellent treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease. By separating away the antrum of the stomach, where the majority of, of stomach acid is produced, uh, you dramatically uh, reduce GERD. And so patients who had who have bad GERD prior to gastric bypass will often see those symptoms disappear. So if you have a patient who has both uh, GERD and morbid obesity, uh, you should consider referring them for uh, gastric bypass. Sleeve gastrectomy, unfortunately, has the opposite effect. Uh, oftentimes, patients who uh, did not have reflux before they had their sleeve will develop it. This can be as high as 20%. And unfortunately, they're often uh, fairly difficult to treat. Um, if they're truly refractory, these patients can get converted to a gastric bypass and that can be effective. Uh, but unfortunately, often uh, 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 insurance does not wanna pay for the second surgery. <clears throat> okay, so I thought I'd just start us off with a case to frame uh, the sort of the first couple of uh, complications that we're gonna talk about. First case is a young woman. She's 30 years old. She has obesity, uh, BMI of 41, uh, and, and underwent a room wide gastric bypass uh, one month prior to presentation. <clears throat> she uh, did very well postoperatively. She was able to go home after a day or two <clears throat> and did fine on a liquid diet. Uh, all these patients start out on liquids and then advance slowly. <clears throat> when she tried to advance her diet beyond liquid, she developed abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, this is a very common presentation after gastric bypass. Um, this is a typical presentation of, of two different complications, uh, both marginal ulcers or anastomotic ulcers or um, anastomotic strictures of the gastrojejunostomy will present like this. It's very common and it's very difficult to separate out the two in terms of their symptoms. Um, so when these patients get referred for endoscopy, I always am prepared to do dilation if necessary uh, and counsel the patient that they could have ulcers or strictures or oftentimes both. Nastomotic ulcers are very common after gastric bypass. Uh, they uh, complicate up to 16% of these surgeries. Uh, they can present as bleeding sometimes, but most commonly it is uh, uh, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting that brings them in. Uh, it happens most commonly in the first three months post-op. Uh, the, the reason for this is thought to be mostly ischemia, just poor blood supply to that new anastomosis. Um, that these patients are, are told to stop taking NSAIDs before surgery. So sometimes though it's, it's NSAIDs that they start taking years later. Um, Smoking really drives these ulcers. Uh, so if patients haven't been, they often will stop smoking to get the surgery. And then a couple of years later, they, they regress and start smoking again. And then they may develop these ulcers. Um, if the patients don't quit smoking, these ulcers will not heal. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a gastrogastric fistula. Uh, rarely it's H. pylori. The diagnosis is typically made by endoscopy. Um, if you do find ulcer, you should test for H. pylori. Uh, the best way to test gastric bypass patients is with the stool antigen. Uh, with this anatomy, uh, breath tests are not accurate. And uh, similarly, uh, biopsies from the gastric pouch are, are rarely diagnostic. Even though it's caused primarily by ischemia, we treat it uh, with acid suppression. Uh, most of these patients will respond to PPIs, usually start with uh, 40 milligrams twice a day. If possible, uh, oral disintegrating tabs work best. These patients do not absorb uh, uh, PPIs well. Um, if they can't get disintegrating tabs, uh, then I usually use capsules and have them break open the capsules before uh, taking it. Patients who don't respond to PPIs we usually add sucrophate uh, four times a day. Um, again, if they don't, aren't able to get the liquid form of sucrophate, uh, they'll get these these tabs, you gotta make sure that they know to dissolve the tabs uh, before uh, take ingesting it. Otherwise, it'll just kind of go past the area and have no real effect. Smoking again, if they are smoking, they really need to stop. 
Um, if there are any foreign bodies in the ulcer, if you see any sutures or staples, you definitely want to remove those because uh, th those will contribute to, uh, uh, will prevent the ulcer from healing. Sometimes if these ulcers are refractory and they're having a lot of symptoms, we'll try over sewing them with endoscopic suturing. Um, you do want to monitor these to resolution, uh, not because of any real risk of um, cancer as you do with gastric ulcers, but because there's a high rate of perforation with these ulcers. Um, so we, I usually schedule them for a follow-up endoscopy. Um, it, they seem to, they heal much slower uh, often than peptic ulcer disease uh, you see in the normal anatomy. Uh, so I usually wait about four months, three or four months for the follow-up endoscopy. If you scope them at six weeks or two months, like you would with a gastric ulcer, they'll almost always be there. And then you have to bring them back for another endoscopy. Sometimes these ulcers just won't heal uh, and they do have to undergo surgical revisions. Unfortunately, a lot of times they get ulcers after the revisions again. Um, so not great options for those refractory cases. These ulcers can be solitary. They can be, uh, sometimes they're just very superficial. Uh, sometimes they're deeper. They can be circumferential. Um, oftentimes I think the, the more superficial ulcers seem to be more painful. Sometimes they're sort of hiding behind the anastomosis. And you can see in the top right-hand corner, my, I have my scope down below uh, the anastomosis in the jejunum and I'm retroflexing back to look at the anastomosis. And you can see, uh, uh, sometimes that's the only way to see these ulcers. So they can be uh, kind of tricky. Um, they can, they're most commonly just distal to the anastomosis, though they can sometimes be in the anastomosis and rarely are they actually in the gastric pouch itself. Here's just some more examples of some uh, uh, painful looking ulcers. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, uh, strictures uh, at the gastrogenostomy will present with this very similar symptoms to uh, those ulcers. And our case, definitely the right answer could have been ulcer or stricture. Um, strictures are also fairly common uh, after gastric bypass, the um, surgeon is trying to make the anastomosis fairly narrow, and sometimes it just is a little bit too tight. Um, the, the, the etiology is often ischemia. Uh, if there's an ulcer, and it, as they heal, they often will result in these uh, strictures as well. Uh, these, again, will most, mostly be diagnosed with endoscopy. Uh, the normal gastrogenostomy size should be somewhere between 10 and 15 millimeters. So it doesn't need to be wide open. Uh, but if you can't get your endoscope through the anastomosis, that basically tells you you have a, a stricture there. Um, and the treatment is, is generally balloon dilation, which is usually very effective. Um, unfortunately, though, it does often take multiple sessions to get it to stay open. Uh, you don't want to over dilate. Um, if the anastomosis gets too open, if it gets big and wide open, the food will leave the pouch very quickly and these patients will be able to sort of overeat again and they, they will uh, not lose weight. And we're going to talk more about that later in the talk. So you don't want to over dilate. Uh, I usually don't go beyond 15 on the first session, um, but it's sometimes two steps forward, one step back. So you may eventually have to dilate uh, to a bigger size to get to a, a reasonable opening for them. Um, again, if there's any foreign bodies, you want to remove those. You want to treat ulcers if they're present because those will those will just drive the, the stricture formation. Um, for refractory strictures, I'll treat. I'll use uh, steroid injections, and if they haven't uh, gotten better after about <clears throat> three or, or four or five sessions, then we'll consider placing a uh, lumen opposing metal stent or the Axio stent in that location. Uh, the stents sit very nicely in these short strictures and can be very effective. Uh, this is an example of a stricture. Um, and uh, you can see it's very narrow on the left there. We pass a wire down uh, below and then over the wire, a CRE balloon and perform dilation. And then you can see after dilation, it looks much more open. Um, usually I would do that and then schedule them to come back, usually about two or three weeks, knowing that the stricture will recur to some degree and plan for repeat dilation until things are, are more open. 
Okay, so the first two uh, complications were related to the gastric bypass. Uh, the next one's gonna be related to the lap band. Uh, the lap band uh, is, um, <clears throat> used to be very popular surgery in, if in, early, in the 2000s. Uh, this was by far the most commonly performed bariatric surgery. Uh, it involves the placement of an adjustable band around the top of the stomach, uh, which creates a small uh, stomach pouch, gastric pouch, um, and prevents accommodation. The band is attached uh, by a, a tubing to a small port that sits just below the skin in the patient's abdomen, and that you can access that port to adjust how much fluid is in the band to make more or less restriction. Unfortunately, this uh, surgery, uh, while it did result in initial uh, good weight loss for patients, they would often lose 100 pounds. Um, <clears throat> most patients who had the surgery would see, uh, after the first two years, almost all that weight would regain um, so it's really fallen out of favor. Less than 5% of bariatric surgery nowadays is, is a, a lap band. I think surgeons spend a lot more time removing lap bands uh, than they do putting them in. Uh, and, the, and the complication we're talking about is lap band erosion, which is these bands are supposed to be uh, on the outside of the stomach, just compressing it. Um, but it, with lap band erosion, the band erodes into the gastric lumen um, the body uh, in this situation forms a capsule around the band, so it doesn't result in a, a true perforation. Um, sometimes these are completely asymptomatic, um, but they can develop abdominal pain, uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, the band will erode to, to varying degrees. I've found these bands just completely eroded in, sitting in the antrum of the stomach. Uh, other times you just see a small amount. Uh, in this picture, you can see the band is eroded in about three quarters. Um, this uh, picture is, is nice because you can see the, the buckle of the band here. The buckle is eroded in, that makes it a lot easier for us to remove these than if this buckle is still um, in the tissue. Um, so the treatment for uh, these, these eroded lap bands is removal. Um, if a surgeon removes it, though, they have to actually cut into the stomach, and it's a pretty big operation. Um, so preferably, uh, we remove these endoscopically. Um, and to do that, we have to, um, initially, we have to cut the band. And we do that by using the device you see at the bottom. These are two examples of the emergency mechanical lithotripter. Um, so these are... Uh, devices that we use in ERCP, uh, basically as, as rescue devices, if we get a, a stone basket stuck on a stone that we can't break, um, then we have to use that to break up the stone or, or, or almost kind of breaks the basket. Uh, so the way this works is you first uh, drive your scope through the band, and then you drop a, a guide wire down into the antrum of the stomach. Then you pull the scope out, leaving the, the wire in place. You then in, reintroduce the scope alongside the wire. And if you drove through the band the first time, the second time you drive on the outside of the band. And then you go down into the antrum of the stomach and you uh, grab the wire and then you pull it out through the mouth. And then you've got here, you can see the wire is then looped around uh, the lap band itself. You then advance the sheath of the mechanical lithotripter, which you can see here, uh, down along the wire. And then this crank on the lithotripter is used to pull the wire such that it goes right through the, the lap band. And then you can see, see in this picture, there's on the right, there's a, you can see a transection of the band. Um, the band is very strong. I've tried to cut them with, with scissors, with various things, with, with needle knife. Uh, none of those things really work, um, but this, this method really works nicely. Um, and once the band is cut, this is what it looks like uh, in the top left-hand corner. <clears throat> and then what we do is we grab the band with a snare, and then it's just really just pull it out through the mouth. Um, I forgot to mention that before you start doing this, you do need to get a surgeon to remove that port uh, from the abdomen and cut the uh, that tubing that is attached to the band. If you <clears throat> don't do that and you pull on the band, 
it'll still be attached to that uh, that tubing and it won't really pull out. So you do want the surgeon to remove that first. Uh, but essentially, uh, once you grab this band, you just pull and, and it comes out through the mouth. Um, it almost always works, uh, if there's particularly if there's enough band showing. Uh, it doesn't always work, though. I had one time where I actually tried, I did this as part of a, a live endoscopy course. And uh, we were able to, I was able to cut the band and I was pulling on it and I spent about 30 minutes pulling on it and uh, the band went nowhere. Um, but it turned out that the band had very dense adhesions to the left lobe of the liver. They went to, they were in the operating room the following week and they spent four hours slicing those adhesions before they were able to remove it. Um, so it doesn't work 100% of the time, um, but usually we can get it out this way. Okay, so moving on to the next um, complication. This one's related to the sleeve gastrectomy. There's another young woman, 25 years old, uh, with obesity, uh, who actually went down to Mexico for a, a sleeve gastrectomy. P patients will frequently go down there if their insurance won't cover bariatric surgery. In, in Mexico, it's much cheaper to get uh, bariatric surgery. Um, she, uh, as they all do, did well for the first couple of days while she was in Mexico and was able to come home. Uh, and then right after she got home, she started feeling unwell. Uh, she developed nausea, vomiting, a lot of reflux. She had oral foaming and chest pressure. Um, she went to the her local ER several times. Um, she was dehydrated. They gave her IV fluids. She got potassium. She got vitamins. Um, she continued to not do well. She, could, she couldn't really go beyond liquids. At the outside hospital, they did an upper GI series. Uh, they did an EGD. Um, and they felt like both tests were normal or were described as normal. That she continued to do well, so she was referred for their evaluation. Um, with these sleeve patients, with this kind of symptoms, what you want to do is really reevaluate the, the upper GI series. Um, in this picture, you can see <clears throat> that this is not truly normal. In this area here, this is the this is sort of the antrum of the of sleeve. And then this area is very narrow. <clears throat> it's another image here where it gets really narrow there. And I don't know if you can kind of tell, it kind of does a twisting there. This is what an upper GI series looks for what's called a sleeve stenosis. Um, contrast uh, will still get through a sleeve stenosis. And so oftentimes, uh, if you don't, don't know what you're looking for, an upper GI series will get read as normal. Um, <clears throat> this is what it looks like on endoscopy. Uh, it's hard to get great pictures, but this you can see is the lumen and it's sort of going this direction. Um, there's sort of a twisting you see here. It's kind of narrows here. With these sleeve stenoses, you will be able to get the endoscope through it. It's, it's not a true luminal stricture, um, but it'll be difficult. It'll take a lot of turning. You probably have both knobs turned all the way in one direction, and eventually you sneak through. And because your scope gets through, people interpret that as a normal endoscopy. But with a sleeve, you sh it shouldn't be so challenging to get down to the antrum. It should be fairly open. You should be able to see the antrum from the body of the stomach. So if you see this twisting, um, that tells you, particularly if, if someone is having symptoms, that this is a sleeve stenosis. And you can see in this picture at the bottom, I injected some contrast through the scope. And you can see again, uh, right here, uh, it's narrowed. And these, these stenoses almost always happen at the level of the incisura. Um, it's uh, really, again, a twisting of the stomach. It's thought to happen because of misalignment of the uh, staplers uh, when, they, when they do the excision of that greater curve of the stomach. <clears throat> but in other cases, it's, it's an adhesion to uh, that part of the stomach that's sort of pulling, pulling on, the, on the sleeve. Um, so the treatment for uh, sleeve stenosis is uh, dilation. Um, but unfortunately, uh, CRE balloons really aren't big enough. They, they won't do much for this. So we have to use the uh, achalasia balloons, um, the, which are usually the Rigiflex balloons. So these are larger balloons. They don't go through the scope. Um, they go alongside the scope. 
Uh, they are, are made for treatment of achalasia. Uh, they come in 30 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and 40 millimeter sizes. <clears throat> the, um, they're advanced usually over a savory guide wire. Um, so you put your scope down into the small bowel, you advance the wire, and then advance the balloon over the wire under fluoroscopic guidance, and then you put, uh, advance your scope alongside it just to make sure it's in the right position. Uh, you really don't don't want to, you want to make sure the balloon doesn't go down past the sleeve. You don't want it to go through the pylorus. Um, you can perforate the pylorus. Uh, you can perforate the duodenum if it gets down in there. So I usually drive my scope uh, down alongside the deflated balloon and make sure the end of it is not um, beyond the antrum of the stomach. Um, usually it'll just cover the whole sleeve. Sometimes these sleeves are, are really twisted and abbreviated and it might ride up into the esophagus a little bit, um, but that's usually okay. Um, so we'll usually start with a 30 millimeter balloon and you can see on fluoro in this bottom right hand corner, there's a, a waste here uh, where that stenosis is at the incisura. These balloons get inflated with air. Um, so you can just see the air shadow there. Um, and uh, you inflate it based on pressure. The max pressure is 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, but I'll generally, on the first session, just inflate until there's quite a bit of resistance um, and then stop and hold it for a couple minutes. <clears throat> and then I have them come back two weeks later. And usually the second time you'll be able to inflate bigger. You might be able to max out the 30 millimeter balloon um, or even go up to the 35 millimeter balloon. And you just keep increasing um, the size every couple of weeks and basically until their symptoms resolve. Usually it's two or three sessions. Um, these, these, uh, these can recur. I definitely have patients that came back every six months or so uh, for one of these dilations and things would get better. Um, the, um, there are other, if they're refractory, some people will do myotomies and other treatments, but most people would get better with the Once you pull the, the stent out, um, the symptoms tend to recur. Um, so the dilation is usually the best treatment for that. All right, so moving on to the next complication. This is, again, something that usually we are seeing with sleeve gastrectomies, which are leaks. Uh, but leaks can occur at any surgical anastomosis. Um, they just are more common with sleeves. Uh, that very long staple line of uh, the sleeve uh, uh, tends to have problems with leaks. Usually it's the very proximal aspect of the sleeve where, where the tissue is, is a little thinner and the blood supply isn't as good. Um, these patients can present at any point. Uh, they can present in the first few days after surgery. I've had patients present as late as almost a year after surgery with leaks. Uh, the ones that present early will usually be very sick and unstable and often have to go to the OR for a washout. Um, uh, revisional surgeries have higher rates of leaks as well. The initial treatment is really just to make them NPO, IV fluids, uh, give them antibiotics, and then you want to get some imaging uh, to look for the leak. Uh, usually that's a CT scan, uh, but sometimes also an upper GI series. Based on those results, uh, they may or may not need a percutaneous drainage of, of an associated fluid collection. It just depends on how big that collection is and what your plans are for treatment of the leak. Leaks are, are very uh, difficult to treat. Um, I always, when I first meet one of these patients, try to mentally prepare them. This could be a very long uh, treatment process. Sometimes it takes several months or even a year to get the leak to close. Really depends on the size of the leak. Small leaks, we can often close very quickly, um, but larger leaks uh, are, are definitely more difficult. Um, there's a lot of things here listed as treatment options. Uh, a lot of patients will end up getting all of these things or, or certainly some of them. Um, overall, the success rates are good for endoscopic treatment. Um, usually we can get these closed eventually. Um, over, unfortunately, we can't usually can't just go in and put in a clip or suture uh, that's closed because the uh, tissue at the site of the leak is very poor. Uh, and that's the reason why the leak happened. It's the same reason why a surgeon can't just go in 
and suture back up the hole uh, because usually that tissue is, is, is not healthy and the leak will just recur. Um, usually the most common things we start with for these patients are either uh, fully covered esophageal stents or internal endoscopic drainage. And I'll show you a little bit more about those here. Uh, so this is an example of a leak. Um, you can see in the left picture, uh, there's a couple arrows pointing you to a little abscess cavity that's alongside the tubular stomach here. And then we did an endoscopy uh, where we found this little hole that you can see on the right, put a little catheter in that area and injected some contrast. And you can see contrast here filling the little abscess cavity. Uh, in this case, we decided to place an esophageal stent um, which you can see here, this is the endoscopic view. This is the fluoroscopic view of the stent in place. You can see that they usually, usually they'll cover the entire uh, sleeve uh, with the proximal aspect of it up in the esophagus. Here's an upper GI series done the next day showing uh, contrast going through the stent and no uh, persistent leak. Uh, we will usually wanna uh, fix the stent somehow either with suturing or uh, an Ovesco uh, clip uh, because these stents will tend to migrate. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they also are often uh, not very well tolerated. Patients will have a lot of reflux. Uh, they'll have abdominal discomfort. They'll have chest discomfort, nausea. They usually don't eat very well. I'll usually actually put in a, a PEG tube uh, at the same time uh, to make sure they get nutrition to help with their healing. My preferred treatment for these leaks is actually to start with internal drainage, which you see here, uh, which involves the placement of double pigtail stents into that small abscess cavity. Um, in this picture on the top left, you can see a little catheter in, into the hole. You can see, again, the leak is at the very proximal aspect of the sleeve. Um, and then you see contrast filling that here. There's already a percutaneous drain for this one. Uh, we place two double pigtail stents or maybe three uh, to internally drain it. That'll allow us to uh, get the percutaneous drain out since we're draining the contents into the GI tract. Um, usually these are much better tolerated than the esophageal stents. Uh, I'll often start with an NJ tube for these patients well with nutrition before we can take it out. Um, but after uh, a few days, we usually let them have clears and advance their diet. Um, we then leave those stents in place for six weeks and then have them come back, at which point uh, we remove the stents and basically reassess whether or not there's still a leak. Uh, in this case, it was resolved. You can see here injected contrast and there's no leak. Um, basically, the, the cavity closes down around um, the uh, double pigtail stents, kind of similar to when we treat pseudocysts or, or pancreatic fluid collections. And then when you pull out the stents, uh, it just collapses down and there's, there's no leak anymore. Um, these patients, uh, again, tolerate this much better. Uh, if the, if the uh, leak is still there, when you remove them at six weeks, then you basically put new stents back in and then you have them come back six weeks later um, and do the same thing. The other option uh, for these patients is called EVAC or endoscopic uh, vac sponge therapy. Um, and this uh, involves the use of a wound vac um, attached to an NG tube. Um, basically what you do is you put an NG tube in, in their nose and then you bring it out through the mouth and then you attach a wound vac sponge that you have to cut down to this size. Uh, you put that on the end of the uh, uh, NG tube and then you grab the end of this sponge with a rat tooth forceps, and then you basically drag it down into uh, the leak. And so you've got, now you've got the sponge down in the leak with the tube attached to it. And um, you attach the other end to a wound vac and you put it on continuous suction. Um, this works really well. Um, particularly for large leaks where you may not be able to put in double pigtails because they'll fall out or an esophageal stent is really not going to do much. Um, this becomes your best option for large leaks. Uh, in other situations, we sort of reserve this uh, for patients that don't do well with the other treatments. 
primarily because it's it's very cumbersome for the patient to have this this tube coming out of their nose, um, and they need to have endoscopies uh, typically once a week. Uh, we at, at, every week we pull the sponge out. It gets gets very uh, uh, full of junk essentially, um, and we pull the sponge out, remove it, and then reevaluate the cavity. This is an example at the bottom right-hand corner where you can see a, a cavity after the sponge was removed. Um, you uh, then attach a new sponge if you think they still need more, more time and drag it back down and do that every, it's, it's every four to seven days. Uh, usually we just do it once a week. Um, and so they'll have this uh, often for four, six, eight weeks. Um, they're always attached to the wound back. They also they can't eat, uh, so you usually either will have a, a, a have them on TPN, or if you can put it again, put in an endoscopic J tube. Um, and uh, eventually, though, this will be uh, effective. So this is kind of a sort of a cumbersome uh, but effective therapy. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's hard to get insurance to pay for the wound back for them to go home, um, so they end up just spending a lot of time in the hospital. All right, so uh, coming back to the gastric bypass, uh, talk, uh, talk about ERCP after gastric bypass. So um, unfortunately, gallstone disease is very common after bariatric surgery, uh, primarily because of the significant weight loss. And um, after gastric bypass, that becomes very difficult for ERCP because the uh, ampulla is now very far away from the mouth. Um, so we can't use our standard ERCP scopes. Um, then nowadays, there are several options uh, for treatment for these patients. They uh, include balloon-assisted ERCP, which means the use of a double balloon enteroscope or a single balloon enteroscope to get to the papilla. Unfortunately, with these long scopes, we have limited devices, um, so we're not uh, going to be successful with very large stones or some other interventions that we normally would be able to tackle with ERCP. Uh, pancreatic work can be very difficult with the balloon uh, assisted ERCP. Another option is uh, having the patient go to the operating room with a surgeon and doing a laparoscopic assisted ERCP, um, which involves the interop creation of a gastrostomy through which you advance a uh, sterilized sc scope, ER normal ERCP scope. Uh, and then it's actually usually pretty easy to get to the papilla. Uh, and it's a fairly straightforward ERCP. Uh, the difficulties with this technique are mostly logistics, uh, getting together with your surgeon. Um, and then the other thing is follow-up ERCPs can be difficult. If you put a stent in, um, then you have to go back and that involves going through a, 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 a gastrostomy uh, after the surgeon will place a G-tube at the end of the first um, procedure. And then you have to Go take that out and go through the track. Getting the ERCP scope through a, a gastrostomy is, uh, is very, very difficult. Um, so that's some, some of the limitations for that technique. Um, another uh, option is the EDGE, uh, which is a really nice new technique that we have involving the use of alumina posing metal stent to create a, a gastrogastric fistula. And I'll show you um, what that looks like. Uh, but first here we have the uh, balloon assisted ERCP. Um, you can see this is the double balloon enteroscope on the left. You can see very long scope, very, very long ways to get there. And this, this is a very short position really. And then you can come at the papilla sort of from, from below, very different view than we're used to with the ERCP. And then um, you can try to cannulate if you've achieved here and get a wire up into the bile duct. And then um, we can do um, can do sphincterotomy, though it's pretty limited. You can see that the wire of the sphincter tome usually doesn't bend very well. So I usually just do a small release sphincterotomy and then do a sphincteroplasty, which you can see in this picture, in these pictures, you can see that there's a CRE balloon, there's the, the waist of the papilla. Um, it, so you're dilating to sort of break that waist, which has happened here. And then you can, um, do stone extraction with an extraction balloon. We can place stents. Uh, we do, we, there are some things that we can do, um, but it is, can be uh, somewhat limited. Here you can see some stents in place, both the endoscopic view and the fluoro view. 
Um, so the other option is the, the uh, edge, uh, which you can see here, uh, which involves uh, essentially bypassing the bypass. And so we uh, basically create a connection between the gastric pouch and the gastric remnant. And so the first thing you do is you put a needle into the gastric remnant and inject a bunch of fluid. And I'll inject some contrast, which you can see here, filling the, the, the stomach, the gastric remnant. And this is our endoscope here. And then you pass a uh, lumen opposing metal stent. You can see here, this is pre-deployment um, through the wall of the pouch and through the wall of the stomach. And then you can see here's the first flange is deployed. And then here is a fully deployed stent, which we're dilating. Um, and in this case, you see I put a double pigtail stent through it. Uh, the reason for that is if we can, we prefer to not do the ERCP immediately, but rather uh, have the patient come back two or three weeks later after a mature tract forms around the stent um, just to make it safer. If you, you We can uh, do it immediately if the patient really needs it. Um, but if you do that, you want to suture the stent in place uh, or use a 20 millimeter stent. Um, because if you drive the ERCP scope through this lumen opposing metal stent, you can sometimes migrate it. So basically it drags on the scope and pulls through. And so if that happens and it's a fresh uh, tract, then you basically have a, a two perforations, one on the, on the pouch and one on the, on the gastric remnant side. Um, in which case you have to try to get the stent back in place and try to close it. So um, it's prefer obviously preferable not to have to deal with that. Um, so if possible, we wait a few weeks and then have the patient come back. And these are examples of this example. You can see the stent is right here. It'd be hard to see, uh, but the ERCP scope is going through that stent. And then we're doing, then it's basically just a standard ERCP. And this, with this technique, if you need to come back, um, to do another ERCP, you can leave this stent in place. Um, it, you do want to take it out as soon as you can um, after those first few weeks, uh, allowing that tract to mature, uh, because the longer it stays in, the longer the risk you're going to have a persistent gastrogastric fistula. Um, if, if, if that happens and these patients can get, uh, then acid can go through the fistula into the pouch and then get the, those marginal ulcers, they can get reflux symptoms. And food can go through the pouch, sorry, through the uh, fistula into the gastric remnant. And so then they can eat more and they might have weight regain. So we'd like to get the stent out as soon as we can, um, but sometimes it's, it's needed for a little bit longer. Okay, so um, the last uh, complication I'm gonna speak about is weight regain after gastric bypass. Um, and this is, one of my uh, favorite things to treat. Um, after gastric bypass, most patients, almost all patients will have profound weight loss in the first year. They'll usually lose hundred pounds or more than that. Um, unfortunately, about 20% of patients will uh, subsequently have significant weight regain where they gain back a lot of the weight that they lost. Usually about, it's considered if they gain back more than 50% of their um, weight loss. If most patients will, will gain back a little bit. That's not what we're talking about. These are patients who are really gaining a lot of their weight back and are, are now uh, morbidly obese again. And you can imagine this is, is very devastating to these patients. They underwent this big surgery. Uh, they were finally feeling healthy, and now the weight is coming back on. Um, and the, the cause is not well understood. Sometimes it's really just dietary noncompliance, um, but we think um, there can be uh, changes in gut flora that occur for some patients, hormonal changes that occur over time. Um, but in some patients, it is their change in their anatomy. And primarily what we see is that gap, that outlet of the uh, pouch gets very big and dilated over time, such that food no longer will stay in the pouch for very long. It, they don't feel full for very long after they eat, so they eat more and they gain weight. Um, this is a results from a study that looked at uh, the size of the gastrogenostomy and weight regain. You can see that the bigger that stoma uh, is, the more uh, weight they will regain. 
This is just an example of uh, some dilated uh, gastrojejunostomies. Uh, you can see uh, th this is a view from the pouch, and we're looking down at the anastomosis here, and the small bowel down below is very wide open. Uh, you could drive three or four scopes through here, um, where we want that size to be around 15 millimeters, so one, one and a half uh, scope sizes. So this is very big. The food will just leave the pouch very quickly so they don't feel full. <clears throat> um, and so what we do uh, to treat this is a procedure called TORI, transoral outlet reduction. Um, where basically, and I'll show you a video of how this works, basically use uh, the endoscopic suturing system to close that stoma back down. Um, this is a short video uh, showing an example. Uh, you can see there, there's a very, again, a very wide open uh, gastrojejunostomy. You can drive several scopes through there. It's probably 30 millimeters. Uh, the first thing I do is treat the edges of the stoma with uh, APC uh, with the goal of exposing uh, the submucosa uh, so that when we suture uh, the stoma down, that those, that'll allow the um, tissue to essentially stick to itself um, so that the, uh, it's not just the suture that's holding things in place, but it's rather, uh, it actually heals in sort of a strictured form in a na more narrow uh, uh, size. Uh, after the APC, we go down with the overstitch attached to, this device attaches to a two-channel therapeutic uh, uh, upper endoscope. Uh, it's nice uh, because you can reload. You can see there we're reloading the suture. You can reload right inside the patient. You don't have to pull the whole device out for each bite. Um, and the, I usually do a circumferential uh, stitching all the way around. Um, this is kind of an older video, um, but it is, we are doing circumferential suturing. I usually do now, I'll do 15 or 20 bites around the edges. In this case, I only, I think we did four. Um, the goal is to, to narrow it down to, uh, again, about a 10 to 15 millimeter size, um, though it will often look much smaller than that right after we're done uh, because of all of the edema from the procedure. These patients um, usually tolerate this very well. Uh, you can see there, I'm inflating a balloon in the center of the stoma. That's a eight to 10 CRE balloon. That's sort of our goal is to have it down to 10 millimeters. So I cinch it down around the balloon. And then we cinch the suture. And you can see there, much smaller, in this case, I think I did some, some pouch sutures as well, but just wanted to give you a sense of, of how this looks and how this works. And this is a, an example of what it looks like afterwards. You can see the difference between um, this and this. So it's really dramatically decreases the size there. And these patients um, get back to feeling full after they eat. Um, and so they have a, a uh, uh, that restrictive feeling back. They don't no longer feel um, like they can just eat everything and, and never feel full like they did before. Um, the uh, typical weight loss with this procedure is going to be about 10% total body weight loss. Um, I, I, you have to cancel patients beforehand. This is not, uh, uh, they're not getting a new gastric bypass. They're not going to lose uh, 100, 150 pounds like they did after their initial surgery. Uh, we're, we're trying to stop the weight, weight gain, um, and we um, will usually get about a 10% weight loss uh, at 6 and 12 months. Some patients will lose more than that. I've had patients uh, lose a lot of weight, um, but I counsel them on average, they're going to see about a 10% weight loss. Usually, it's very well tolerated. There's very few adverse events. I think I've had one patient have a bleed. Um, in this study, uh, there was one patient that had a stenosis. Um, I actually uh, don't mind if they get a stenosis. I'd rather the uh, uh, procedure work too well than not work well enough. Uh, it's very easy to go in and dilate um, the uh, anastomosis if it, if it gets too tight. Um, so I, I always, I never feel bad when they get a stenosis. 
Um, and these patients are always very grateful. Uh, usually they've seen several other people have told them there's no options. Uh, and they're, they're again, uh, very devastated at regaining all this weight uh, that they worked so hard to get off. And uh, they feel so much better after uh, they, they lose it again. So they're very, it's very rewarding uh, to help these patients. They're always incredibly uh, grateful. Um, so uh, that's all I was gonna cover today. It looks like we're basically out of time as well. I know you guys have something else afterwards, but I'm uh, certainly happy to um, answer any questions that uh, anybody might have.